Back in the late 70s, Marvel Comics was really trying to expand its market share and break into movies and television by creating several shows based on their most popular characters. The most successful of these, and probably the only one you've ever seen, was The Incredible Hulk. The other series, which never amounted to anything and we never really talk about, included such bombs as The Amazing Spider-Man, which sucked, Doctor Strange, which sucked, and of course, Captain America, which starred Red Brown. And really, is that not the most perfect casting choice for a superhero you've ever heard in your life? I mean, who in the hell else would you cast as Captain America? Just look at the guy. He looks like the prototypical superhero. He looks like Captain America. Well, I tracked a copy down on VHS, but first I know what some of the fans of the Nostalgia Critic are saying right now. Well, he already reviewed Captain America, didn't he? Congratulations. Hail Hitler! And you'd be right, he did, but he reviewed a Captain America movie, not this Captain America. Why in the hell you'd want to watch a Reb Brownless Captain America movie is beyond me, but in the spirit of critic camaraderie, I sent a copy of Reb Brown's Captain America to the Nostalgia Critic's house and threatened him with blackmail photos of him dressed as a dirty ballerina from the outtakes of Spooning with Spoonie 2 if he didn't cooperate. So, let's go live via satellite to the Nostalgia Critic's house in Illinois and see if we can get his thoughts on Captain America. <laughs> That's the coward's way out, and you know it, Critic! Uh, who else we got? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Captain America, let's go live to Linkara, nationally pitied comic book expert. Um, Linkara, what can you tell our viewers about Captain America? Ah, Captain America! Well, it starts during World War II. A scientist creates a super soldier serum that he decides to test out on wimpy little Steve Rogers, who wants to join the army but can't because, well, he's a wimp. So anyway, after that... Yeah. That's neat. Uh, listen, guys, you can forget all about that because it's got nothing to do with this movie. Then why did you ask me to do this? I was deliberately wasting your time. I'm a friggin' of service! If I'm gonna suffer, I'm gonna take all you bastards with me. Anyway, the movie starts off with a real bang as we follow Reb playing former Marine Steve Rogers as he races, uh, speeds, well, sort of leisurely cruises across scenic California. I figured you got out of the Marines two weeks ago. Well, I've been coming down the coast slow and easy, you know, kicking back. Pretty mellow set of wheels. Yeah. Captain America! Too much excitement in your superhero movie? Try Captain America, the superhero who takes it slow and easy, kicking back in his pretty mellow set of wheels. Steve gets a call from a very worried Carl Sagan who wants to tell him something important in person. But little does Steve know that some villains have somehow managed to orchestrate a surprisingly elaborate trap involving a false road crew, a mountain detour, and a tanker truck rigged to create an oil slick to send his van spinning off the road. makes the villain from Riding with Death look positively amateur. Dunk! And we were so sure a 15-foot roll off a gentle slope of 20 miles an hour would kill him. Well, thankfully Reb survived, but those bastards, they ripped his favorite polo shirt. No way they live! No way! And then abruptly, Steve just forgets about the whole attempted murder thing and his friend who's in deep trouble and goes to visit this lab where his father used to be a scientist. Honestly, I have no idea why he just decides to show up here after rolling his van, but he does. Your father developed and perfected the ultimate steroid. He synthesized it from his own adrenal gland and then, through long research, developed a super hormone. He called it FLAG. That's right, F-L-A-G. Full latent ability gain. Because it worked, he could accomplish things no other man could hope to. And so, he dedicated his life to helping the little guy in our society. To righting wrongs that the law wouldn't or couldn't touch. You mean he was a super crime fighter? Well, geez, Steve's dad sounded way more interesting. Why couldn't the movie be about him? The scientist has to run some tests on Reb because the serum only works for a little while but is ultimately fatal to all the animals they've tested it on. But since Steve's father developed it from his own cells, they figure it might work on Steve as well. But that might be interesting, so Steve decides he'd much rather be Captain Boring instead. I think I paid my dues to Uncle the way my dad would have wanted. Now I just want to get out on the road, look at the faces of America, 
Maybe get some down on canvas. I don't want to report in or check out. I just want to kick back and find out who I am. I want every day to be the same. Captain America! No, no, no. You know what? I'm being unfair. I should not be using the Superman movie music. I should be using the Captain America movie music. Step aside, John Williams! Oh dear God, this is awful. Nobody could look heroic with this music playing. It sounds more like an infomercial for industrial polymers. 3M. Innovation. Research. Providing Captain America with new, lightweight aerodynamic shielding. The miracle acrylic bubble makes it possible. Anyway, Steve rides his motorcycle over to Carl Sagan's house only to find the place ransacked and Carl murdered. Oh, what? He's a lifelong friend and we don't even get a JACODA! Okay, well, keep in mind, this movie was made in 1979, before Reb even made Your Hunter from the Future. So try and keep in mind that Reb had not exactly perfected his acting method yet. And besides, he can't call out the villain's name because he has no idea who did it. Who could have possibly committed these horrible, grisly crimes? What manner of villain who... Uh, presumably works at an oil company, could want Steve and Carl Sagan dead. Uh, well, I don't know, but um, maybe the movie will tell us. Eventually. Uh, it, it could be that guy, maybe. Um, we'll, we'll just give him a minute to park, and uh, that might take a little while. Um, and we'll wait for him to get out of the car, and slowly approach the door. <laughs> you know, it, it's probably good they showed every single fucking step towards the door, because otherwise I might have just assumed he fucking teleported inside the building. I mean, how else are you supposed to know? Well, it turns out this guy, oil tycoon Mr. Brackett, was trying to extort some secret microfilm out of Carl Sagan containing the secrets of a brand new neutron bomb that he was trying to build. Unfortunately, one of his henchmen accidentally killed him while torturing him for its location. And that's when Steve wandered onto the scene. He said Hayden told Rogers something before he died. What did he tell him? Parker couldn't hear it. And it's fortunate your accident didn't work out. Well, why in the hell did you try to kill Steve in the first place? That took place at the very beginning of the movie. How did they even find him? Why were they looking for him? He didn't even know anything about the microfilm. They knew he didn't know anything about the microfilm, and even if he did, the last thing you'd want to do is kill him! If things were so desperate that they were willing to torture Carl Sagan to get the location of the microfilm, wouldn't you want Steve to meet Carl so Carl would bring the microfilm out in the open, and then you'd know where it is? How did they set up such a complicated trap requiring such a specific location on what must have been short notice? How did they get ahead of him to prepare the ambush when even by Steve's admission, he's been wandering aimlessly without a definite destination or agenda for months now? Oh, and by the way, if they were trying to make it look like an accident, the uh, two-mile perfectly uniform oil slick right at Dead Man's Curve, it might have tipped the authorities off. Hello? Steve Rogers? Yeah, who's this? A friend. A friend who's very upset about what happened to Jeff Hayden. There's a gas station on Pine Canyon Road, about two miles north of Interstate 5. If you can be there, alone, in 20 minutes, I'll tell you who did that little job tonight, and why. It's a trap! And sure enough, the villains lure our unarmed, lunk-headed hero who didn't think to call the police into a trap, and they chase him off a cliff and ruin another one of his sweet rides. The next thing we know, Steve's in surgery for all of his grave injuries, and the only way Dr. Mills can save him is to inject him with the Flag Super Serum without his consent, granting him unbelievable strength, speed, agility, and a healing factor. And somehow, Steve finds a way to whine about this. What I mean is... What you mean is, you really don't know. I'm talking about my life, Simon. But I'm not grateful for the fact that for the rest of my life, I'll never really know how long I have. We will not test. We're not going to find out what Flag may have done to me, because I don't want to know. Steve, you owe it to science to continue... To continue something I didn't start. <laughs> He's so boring. This is one of the most boring superhero movies I've ever seen in my life. Nothing happens! Reb Brown delivers a performance so low-key, it's almost like he's on horse tranquilizers. Throughout the entire film, the guy never so much as even raises his voice. How can you do that? How can you get Reb Brown in a movie and not let him do what he does best?
That's what you hire the man for! It's like putting Hugh Grant in a movie and not have him stammer and blink rapidly. It's also funny how it doesn't really seem like the serum did anything to Steve. The dude was already massive before the injection. It'd be like Lou Ferrigno playing both David Banner and the Hulk and not even bothering with the green body paint. Well, the bad guys decide to dispense with the whole make it look like an accident thing and kidnap him with a silence revolver, which I'm pretty damn sure is impossible. They take him to a meatpacking plant because... Uh, fuck it. Uh, Steve's got super strength now, so he beats the bad guys up. Okay, I lied again. Uh, he tosses one guy into another and then just runs off and hides so he can throw pork at them from the shadows. And, um, I, I know you're not going to believe this because uh, I have a hard time believing it. And just to make sure, I went back and watched it again to count. But, uh... That was the only fight scene in the entire movie. And it never seems to occur to anyone to interrogate the captured thugs to find out, you know, who sent them or why. Nor do the repeated attempts on Steve's life prompt him to seek any kind of government protection. In fact, all he wants to do is keep whining about how he wants to be an artist. Sensational. Can I keep it? In the meantime, Dr. Mills keeps trying to win Steve over into becoming a crime fighter, this time by showing him all the cool toys he'd get to play with, like a super van with a hidden rocket-launching stealth motorcycle in the back. Ah, yes, remember Captain America's trademark panel van and motorcycle? <laughs> you know, I bet even Batman doesn't have a bat van. Oh, and how can he have Captain America without his vibranium steel alloy shield? Oh, I mean his flimsy plastic shield! It's bulletproof. And... A rather deadly weapon. No, it isn't. It weighs 12 ounces tops. A fucking chihuahua could catch that thing and run off with it. Well, at least it probably represents the colors of the United States. You know, red, transparent, and blue. Why don't you try it out, see what it can do. Meanwhile, the evil Mr. Brackett has found the microfilm, kidnapped the lovely scientist, and finished his neutron bomb, rigging it to a dead man switch hooked to a heart monitor. So if he dies, the bomb detonates. And this finally stirs Steve into action. You're going to need something to protect you on that bike anyway. Why not make it a disguise? Something that'll make it impossible for them to remember or even recognize you at all. You gotta be kidding, this is my drawing. Why not? It's perfect. They ridiculed your father, remember? Called him Captain America and finally murdered him. Be Captain America, Steve. Jam Captain America down their throats and at the same time protect yourself. <laughs> about fucking time. You know what? Here's a game for you folks at home. See if you can guess how long it is in this movie before you actually see Captain America in full costume fighting crime. You know, just ballpark it within, let's say, five minutes or so. You ready? Seventy-four minutes. You wait an hour and 14 minutes before you see the title character in a fucking superhero movie. You weren't waiting this long for the hero to emerge in fucking Unbreakable. And of course, the costume just looks awful. The zipback Lycra jumpsuit is bad enough, but the worst part by far is the inclusion of a blue motorcycle helmet with white wings and an A painted on it, which is just wrong. And of course, the costume is absolutely essential for concealing Steve's identity from villains, which is why the only thing covering his face is a pair of completely transparent goggles! Well, Cap attacks the refinery, but the villain's already left, so he interrogates his scientist henchman to find out what his evil plan is. What's he going to do? Tell me. He's got the bomb. The neutron bomb. What's he going to do with it? No, no, no. That's not how you do it. You do it like this. Tell me where the bomb is! Won't tell him a thing. They find out that Brackett's plan is to rob a gold repository in Phoenix, Arizona for $1.4 billion in gold bricks by destroying the entire city with his neutron bomb. But why? Brackett is no mad dog killer. He is after something. What? But why? Brackett is no mad dog killer. He is after something. Ah, well, he sounds like the picture of mental health. He's about to nuke Phoenix, you fucking Nimrod! This is really one of the stupidest supervillain plans I've ever heard in my life. How exactly does he plan to steal 
and transport $1.4 billion in gold bullion, uh, I'm sorry, radioactive gold bullion, actually, where in the fucking world would he be able to hide after dropping a neutron bomb on the United States of America? Who would take his money? Where could he possibly spend it? Who would want it? The guy would be the most universally loathed, despised, and hunted criminal and mass murderer in American history. It makes Goldfinger's plan look positively brilliant and subtle. So the elusive Robert Denby loads his Tripolitine into a truck and curls up with a good book while Ben Murphy plays the unwitting driver Pawn and Dr. Hale falls along secretly from his helicopter. Ah, ah, ah. Oh man, I wish I was watching Riding with Death right now. That movie made so much more sense. Okay, so Cap jumps onto the truck, and instead of just beating up the villain like, you know, a superhero, he bends the truck exhaust pipe to flood the cargo compartment with smoke. Unfortunately, the toxic fumes cause the guy to asphyxiate, and he starts to die. This leads to the dramatic climax of the film, where our brave hero, a former Marine who doesn't know any form of first aid, has to call his boss in to administer CPR while he stands to one side looking completely useless. He's breathing easier now, that's all right. And then it's over! <laughs> you know, I'm sorry if it seems like I'm upset, but I, I kind of am. You know, this, this is the first really, really bad, unsalvageable Reb Brown movie I've ever seen. I mean, it completely wastes the guy. It, I, I, I guess I just can't believe how badly they dropped the ball, not only in making a Captain America movie, but a superhero movie in general. We're talking about a hero whose origin story is that he punches Hitler in the face and that's not good enough for you? you no, no, no. You rewrite it to where he's a whiny ex-marine who drives around in a panel van throwing bacon at oil tycoons. The guy throws more pork in this movie than his trademark fucking shield. That's right. Captain America doesn't throw his shield one single time! Well... <laughs> until the sequel, that is. <laughs> hey, I can't believe it. I won't believe it. There are 12 in-place missiles within that area, four mobile missiles. Los Angeles Gold Repository, 92 million currently on deposit. Far West National Emergency Command Center under the San Bernardino Mountains and the Phoenix International Gold Repository, 1.4 billion in bullion. And a neutron bomb only kills people. The gold will be intact. Simon, that's got to be it. But why? Brackett is no mad dog killer. He is after something.